two games he has won over Team Freedom, making us wonder if Team Freedom will ban him out. I know the next Battleground, though. Don't know if I can say yeah. I'm just going to say it. We're going to go to Tomb next. I want Zugrug Stitches back. Where the heck is that? Where the heck is it? I don't know. Dang it. I mean, you don't... You don't want a Stitches versus Garrosh. You're going to get thrown in and be a sad Stitches. Yeah, you're not going to want to play anymore. He doesn't play so well, you know. It turns out he's just not very good at sharing. But the fact that we are going to Tomb, this is uh, going to be pretty good, I feel like, for the members of Roll20 here in this game. I'm suddenly really scared for Team Freedom with the ways game number one went. Obviously, game two is a bit of an outlier, but still it wasn't looking pretty even when things were on the same talent tiers throughout the beginning half of the game. But let's figure it out. Can Team Freedom find a way to be able to deal with it? Does it start with the Garrosh? It does not. Ariel is banned out, but they could first pick it still if they really think it's that big of a problem. Because we have to keep in mind, Roll20 has been willing to pick it before the secondary ban phase of every game so far. I was talking about Team Freedom stitches, but they don't generally play stitches here. It's still a new Barak preference on Team of the Spider Queen. Gives them a lot of mobility in their rotations. Uh, the peel possibilities for his team. What do they want to first pick here? They have first picked Greymane before and Ariel. This time Ariel's banned. Tassadar. They'll get the Tass. Tassadar still going strong in North America. Garrosh Chromie. So now you can't win with the macro pressure as well if you want to go into the Ariel, but it was banned on the other side, so it's not the same case that we saw of the Dragonshire, but the same rotation or at least priority being displayed still for Rule 20, and the Garrosh is over. So how does Team Freedom deal with this? They've got to make up through it. I feel like through macro somehow. There is one big silver lining here, and Garrosh's biggest downside is his lack of mobility, and Force Wall is going to be mm -hmm. a tool that they can use to make up for that, and Tassadar, soft counter in the sense that the flip over Tassadar shield is very convenient, but also, much like in Stitch's compositions, you create a target who is untargetable with that flip. Yes, you may be able to hit him with it, but in the end, you have to perfectly one-shot the Tassadar 100 to zero, or he will just dimensional shift away and say, thanks for the cooldowns. I'm really hoping that Freedom won't give Roll20 Uther off of the Garrosh combo, though, again. The Garrosh, yes, but at least make it a little hard to combo stuns off of that, a little bit. I mean, I agree with you. I, I think that would be the smartest direction for them to go, especially considering there's already an Aureal band. They've double picked onto the uh, to the supports already. Every single one of all the other supports existing into the game generally appreciate having a cross-supporting somehow. And right now, there aren't too many heroes within the meta that are able to provide that cross-supporting other than other supports, which we know has fallen out, at least here for North America with the double supports composition, especially with Ariel removed. The mouth L ban, a bit curious, but at the end of the day, it's just removing a solid soul laner. He can rip through Garrosh. I mean, that makes a lot of sense too, considering the fact that his passive would just not affect Malfail's exactly. passive. It's funny, because like Lunara, you see the dot and you're like, Garrosh does a pretty good job with this. Like the damage gets less and less and less, but then you're like, so then he's good against dots, but then you forget, you know, Malfail just doesn't care. Yeah, he, it's he, a different kind. Different kind of dot, different kind of hero. Love the Uther ban. Team Freedom does seem to feel like they are still drafting for the most part the way they were at midseason brawl or even before they went to midseason brawl and sort of in their meta like the tassadar Greymane, yeah that combination and roll 20 just seems to have made adjustments already into the next state of the north american meta in bringing in garrosh and that is kind of one of the it really is one of the reasons why we talk about teams going to an international event and then coming back and having some difficulty in trying to figure out, okay, how is this going to do versus everything that people have been playing so much against each other during the time that we were gone and not scrimming these teams? It is, it's a really weird kind of conundrum in effect. And honestly, it's one I feel like I could talk about for a long while. Like, it's just, it's a very weird circumstance of 
We know our meta isn't the best, but there are certain aspects of it that are got to be respected, even considering the international. And when we go abroad, we realize that we cannot run all the things we typically do, so we adjust, we play according to their play style, and we learn it when playing against those teams. But then we take that step back, it's those small elements that actually are good within your meta, the weird things that change an entire draft in the way that it's played, that suddenly make it to where you're like, oh, I'm losing this game, but I'm drafting my international meta style, not drafting according to what I think I can to beat this team individually. Mm -hmm. And you essentially have to go, do I accept what I might have to play if I qualify for the next international, or do I win the games that get me there in the first place? I mean, I have my own philosophy on it, and honestly, it differs quite heavily from a lot of the teams that we see here in North America. And you talked about it. When are we going to get the Stuke off? He's Even together. Got him. I, I really like Stuke off. <laughs> I just want to say that. I haven't gotten to talk much about him, but I really like Stukov. Being a you know support with wave clear that costs essentially zero mana and an AoE, like you have great siege, you have great counter momentum, like you have so many awesome things in your kit. You're extremely difficult. Probably, I would personally be willing to say the highest skill cap support in the game, even though it doesn't seem like that, uh, just because you're like, other ones have more intricate, more elaborate things. But to truly be effective, like I would argue the reason we don't see Stukov is because of how hard he is actually to be effective. Every passive has to be near 100% value. It's like Palm of Karazim. If you just can't hit it, you just can't play the hero. And I feel like a lot of people are just like, I'd rather just not learn the Stukov because somebody else can kind of do his role, but just lose that one element, which is the AoE silence, and people like Malfurion make up for that. So go with what you know rather than learn maybe what might be a notch up. Yeah, I'm stoked to see the Stukov. I, it is Buds playing Stukov, and we haven't gotten to see his Stukov yet. He has a lot of good follow-up after Dahaka and Garrosh, but... They also have Glowering's Medivh to help. So if Kier hunts in as Illidan, and there's that initial burst of damage that they've got Force of Will, they have Portal to help make sure that that target stays alive through that initially when everyone engages. And then you've got the Stukov heals to back that up, get everyone healed back up, and then get back into the fight. This is it for Roll20. If they can win this game, they will take the series. Let's see if Team Freedom can bring it back. When I was talking about the Stukov before, when you threw out the idea, I was talking about how silences hurt everyone. And I think there's a cool interaction that we might be able to see here that not only conveys that point, but it also, again, it could be really dope to see it unfold. Is it the self-silence? It's the self-silence yeah. under Illidan yes. specifically. So you find a case where you know Illidan is probably, when you think of auto attackers in Heroes of the Storm, he is top three of filling that role. I think like, Vala, Raynor, and mainly, I don't even think Vala, honestly. Raynor, Illidan, I don't know. Ins are another. Shadowstalk, Zeratul, if you will. And all cases of that, he's going to get on top of the target. He wants to get the chase down, and he wants to kill the Stukov. But he doesn't get to do what Illidan does best if he cannot cast Evasion. If he doesn't have his E, he's useless. So suddenly, he has to second-guess initiations going in. Granted, if Buds is just using his Lurking Arm to only save himself, that's a winning trade. So it's, a, it's a just, again, a really beautiful dance that Stukov has to face, and in my opinion, part of the reason he isn't as relevant as we see some of the other supports. Every other Stukov build we have ever seen uses Growing Infestation as a way of being able to increase the silent size, and then combos that later on with uh, not only within my reach to give him more range on that, but then lingering spines so that even when you drop it down, it'll last and persist for 1.5 seconds longer so that you don't have to be as immobile. Buds is not doing that. We're going for a questing talent, Fed and Touch. So he is throwing out hero or weighted pushel on hero. Nice toss on Kira, but he gets back oh. out. But he'll be reducing the, the cooldown. Not enough. Man, that was close. Yeah, it was. He'll be reducing the cooldown and then removing its mana cost later on. But this makes me wonder what kind of build we might be seeing. You know, there's a possibility of being able to root later on uh, with Weighted Pushel at 13. That is the talent I want to talk about. Yeah. I adore that 13 on him. So what it is is uh, if anybody is not a Stukov player at home, you have to essentially hit your W onto a target and get your Plague out there. And then if you throw down the Lurking Arm, and they in fact are directly silenced by it, if you activate your passive, sacrificing your heal, you can root them within your silence. Essentially being a Twilight Dream root dream after a Void Prison in one hero. You can do it on your own. It is insane 
the kind of value it can get. Illidan alone, if he wants to move in for a kill, you hit one W on top of him, throw down your E, and if you hit that passive, he's just going to die. But you lose all healing in the process if you go that direction. So it suddenly goes even more so what is a high risk, high reward hero in how you use your passive, it makes it that much stronger, but that much riskier on the other side. Who uses evasion while he's underneath the towers pulled back. And then the drag, but friend or foe existed and it was just enough, just in time for Cure to get back. Dodges Arcane Rift. Glowrung was hungry for that kill. Team Freedom, the team that also, you know, with Dainsky has a very impressive grit, or excuse me, but deep play. Cure eventually did end up getting caught here on the bottom half. Didn't catch quite what happened, but either way, I'm expecting that was more of an outplay than it was a misplay, because that was. I mean, Cure was so low for so very long, they had to assume that was risky. Portal down, Glong is going to be just fine. And we find ourselves in a situation where Roll20 still pulling ahead here into the earlier stages. When will Freedom be able to stop the bleeding, turn the game around into their favor? Uh, Team Freedom had been running with Tassadar and Illidan in the bottom lane. They've brought down Nazmus to try to do the same thing basically keep the pressure going against Goku. They don't want to let Goku alleviate what they have done in that lane. They want this to be the place where they are winning because in the other lanes, they're not. Rule 20 is rotating around and starting to drain ammo in the mid bot. So they need to win somewhere and losing Illidan was regretful for them because it did mean that they had to pull Nazmus down, even more resources to that bottom lane. There was a slight adjustment too when it comes to that Stukov build out of Buds, going with one good spread. So focusing on more AOE healing across the board with two second CDR as long as his heal affects three heroes onto his team. That was when looking at some of the iterations, I'll be honest, Stukov actually has, in my opinion, some of the most talent diversity out of any hero in the game, which is kind of cool why we see such a wild build coming out from him. Really nice silence here for Buds. Look at that lockdown that Roll20 has in the long run. Like They do such a good job of just kind of making you unable to control your hero. It's got to be such a pain to deal with. Yeah, rounding corners too. You can see it's it's sort of weird with Groundbreaker when the terrain's in the way, but it does offer a pretty much guaranteed place where you can pull somebody in knowing the range of that Groundbreaker. But as you were saying with Stukov. Oh, I, I, I'm going to be honest. I was now distracted by the idea that if a Garrosh ends up getting a flip into a lurking arm pool. Can we call that a cannonball instead of the wrecking ball? Because it's like doing a cannonball into the pool. You know, the plague he sits on the ground. I think that makes perfect sense. I, I, you know, I think so too. It's not a pool anybody, for health reasons, should want to swim in. No. And honestly, it's a lurking arm. Like, it's more of an arm than it is a pool, but in my brain, I view it as the purple pool of death. Much like the black pool of death that Asmodan just... I think just you should change your casting style to say that. <laughs> Garrosh flips into the purple pool of death. <laughs> You're probably, I don't know if I could get away with that. I'm not quite the rap god that some of the other talent that we have are, but one day, one day, Gilly. Oh, I wondered if that, uh, I am pretty sure we're gonna be moving into the Rue at 13 now, getting targeted excision, because as long as you only detonate one weighted pustule, then you reduce the cooldown of bio kill switch to five seconds, so it's not as draining for your heal. You'll still be able to have it for your heal. And with but the cooldown of your heal. What is the trade off, Gilly? At what cost? We gotta be asking ourselves here. So what that means, that if you want, wow, Zugrug, he gets pulled, the cleanse, and a kill. Really well done here from roll 20. They're not done getting the flip to Slowing Sands. Yikes! Everything about this Death Ball flip composition that we see out of Roll20 is just way too much to be able to deal with here so far for Team Freedom. Team Freedom needs to find a solution and find it now. There goes the flip into Glaurung, who is there. Nazmus dies. 15 gems drop down. Kier doing his best to, to pick all of those up. But he has to get back as Dahaka stalks in. Roll 20, get the first turn in of the game. They're climbing ahead in experience, and they are about to climb ahead in structures. What I was going to say is the synergy between the four and seven is extremely good here coming out from Buds. It increased the, wow, Kira getting flipped, friend or foe. Drag actually didn't land there either, so good job making it out there because that was very, very close. Hey, Dred, did you want to give some analysis? I really, you know, I <laughs> wanted to, but I think I'm going to wait this Web Weaver phase because now at this point I don't think it's going to be awesome. To be completely frank, I'm just more hyped about Stukov because I've been waiting for this hero to be picked within the North American scene and it, more importantly, gain a little bit of power with the new Portal. support changes coming in. Seems like he's getting a little, at least a little bit here. There it is. There's the pull, the toss, Zugrug, Dwarf tosses back out. I feel like that is going to be a thing that we end up saying a lot yeah, this I, part. I'm at the point where 
I just don't call flips unless I'm confident that it's going to be at least 50% or more. Because, let's be honest here, that cooldown's pretty short. Uh, you Made know? shorter, potentially at 16. Yeah, and uh, he gets a lot of flips. And also, Justin is just very good. Oh, Cure, though. Cure. Can he get a flip? 32 gems. Oh, Man that meta! Oh. No, Leyline! Not like this, Cure. You were the chosen one. Uh. No! At least the gems are still here. The front gate wasn't killed fast enough. Now the members of Freedom, they're panicked. Oh, the Look flailing at swipe right Beautiful. into the corner. Nazmus and Zugrug, and Nazmus will go down, tossing Kalushin back. This time, I don't know if they can get the gems back. <laughs> oh my, Freedom just does not, you know, I feel like they're learning that Freedom doesn't come free here because they don't get much of it in this game. World 20 is just flinging them all over the place. Between the slow, the silence, I mean, the double slows, they've got a drag of a D portal. Dread, why didn't we consider this from game one when Roll20 showed Garrosh the synergy with Glaurung's Medine? I didn't. I honestly don't know. I'm a little disappointed now that I thought about it, but that was gross. Like, <laughs> because the flip puts you perfect distance between the two portals. So it's like, well, you can go one way to escape, or you can go the other way to escape, or you can just, I don't know, just die, which is going to happen a lot of the case here. Unless Freedom somehow finds a way to not get caught and get an initiation, they have this Web Weaver phase. The 13 talent tier hasn't been picked up for roll 20. And so really this is honestly one of the only windows I feel like they're going to be able to get in this game because roll 20 is making so much happen so consistently that if they aren't effective with this Web Weaver phase, it could get out of hand. Oh, there's the pull and toss. Follow up Warlord challenge. Cleanse I mean, comes in. It just hurts my brain to think about how many CCs just went down there. I mean, it was like five. And those are basic kids. Those aren't even really that much heroic usage coming out from them, other than, you know, for Garrosh. Team Freedom at least rotated around as fast as they could to siege along with the mid Web Weaver. But they've been dealt with by Roll20, and there isn't an immediate opening up of the battleground for Freedom. The closest thing is that bottom four as Roll20 gets to level 13. And Freedom lost so many gems, at least 30 in the transfer between Illidan to Rhaegar, and then Muradin not being able to get it. So they're sitting at only 17 out of 55. And just looking at Roll20, having 106 over 55, that puts into perspective how far behind Team Freedom are if you couldn't realize otherwise. Yeah, you know, if everything else wasn't added up enough, that's a pretty straightforward number comparison. If Roll20 plays this clean, I know this sounds funny, but they could just flat win the game. Like, if they keep playing this with the aggression that we've seen displayed, like, this is a Web Weaver phase into a couple of kills, which already they're doing their best to make happen. This is going to be a minimum triple four, I'm guessing, on the first phase. The secondary turn-in will get them into the 16 talent tier with a two and a half level lead, and suddenly you go boss turn-in game. They have enough gems for that actually to be a rotation. Mm -hmm. So now it's really freedom. Get 13 talent tier and stop this at all cost. Cure getting flipped, taunted, silenced, Silence. dead. This is disgusting. Leyline. Leyline. Zugrug's caught, Goku's waiting in the wings, drag cleanse, slowing sands, a bomb will hit him, but he survives. Now the 15's picked up. We have to remember top and bottom Web Weavers are still alive. Also, that there is enough gems for a turn in in the hands of Roll20 after these Web Weavers go down. This is riding the hype train I was talking about that they very much can make happen in this game. They even got to cycle up through top, getting the Medi portal down. Zugrug trying to stop it. So adaptations used. Tassadar trying to kite. He gets dimensional shift back, actually makes it. Is going into Archon form now. Team Freedom have had enough. They jump on top of Roll20, going after Buds, who swipes them away. But Kira is not to be stopped. Meta's on top of the team, does get taunted, but they still have Justing. 23 gems, if they can finally bring him down, one more force of will keeps him alive as he throws away Nazmus, the damage dealer. But in the end, finally, Team Freedom get a kill and slow things down for Roll20. And they've got to do something drastic if they're going to recover from this game, because I mean, they got one kill is all they can claim for their own. The 16 talent tier is closed in by Roll20. They don't have enough gems for a turn in themselves. Going to this boss is, in fact, without a doubt, the best play that Team Freedom can really make happen at this stage. And picking it up will deter the members of Roll20. What I want to know is, does Roll20 understand that this isn't too big of a deal to give up? Oh. Unless they go in and steal it themselves. Ooh, hello, Rich. 
Thankfully, Team Freedom get that boss, that hard-earned boss. Fortunately for them, there are web weavers for Roll20, but it gives them time. What I was uh, kind of talking about there with, you know, deciding to commit to the boss, it makes a lot of sense now, but it just was, Roll20 has a window here where they didn't necessarily need to commit to that turn-in. They could have rid of this boss and forced the turn-in on top, still have the 16 talent here, and no web weaver gets a free clear. At the end of the day, they kind of have that. Still, the top boss is going to be responded to, and the top web weaver is not going to do too hot. Teardrop and Metamorphosis just to survive this gank established by those Medivh portals. Yeah, the cooldown of Justin's combo and Medivh's portals is slightly shorter than the cooldown of Metamorphosis. This is just so scary. It, it least, is really scary. The best thing going on for oh. Freedom, oh gosh, the combo. The silence, cleanse used, Zugrug survives. Stormbolt is going to be sent as a response, but like... That forces Avatar, though. I, it, not only does it force Avatar, I want, like... They're keeping the keeps alive. There's zero counterplay unless Freedom stops being patient. Like, the only way I see Freedom winning these fights is when a flip happens, it happens on Muradin. He gets cleansed, you Avatar, everyone alls in and just take that fight. But then there's Leyline, there's Slowing Sands. Like, mm -hmm. there's so many awkward flailing... Uh, or excuse me, what is the heroic choice here? Flailing swipe, that mm -hmm. was the wording I was looking for. All these kind of anti-AOE momentum tools for Roll20. Yeah, the comp of but Roll20 you can't do this. is, it's amazing. But Freedom don't want to engage until they have 16. If they lose a keep, it's mid keep. It is not the end of the world. They're keeping it alive for a long time. Oh man, Goku catches Kira. No, Kira's down. Kira's lost some of the gems, but importantly, that's no Illidan now for 35 seconds as Freedom were just about to get 16. They were on the horizon of a place where they could team fight against Roll20. And now they must sacrifice this keep. Mid keep is going to go down. Top four will most likely going to follow shortly after. And only 25 gems separate Roll20 away from what could be their last Webweaver phase. With that boss being taken earlier on here, at least it bought time for Team Freedom that they don't have to be too concerned about an actual win condition Webweaver phase and boss up on top. So it is better than it could be for Team Freedom, but they've got to make something happen. They need to find a way to get enough pressure onto the map and force a fight or just bait somebody in and getting flipped and finding a way to turn things around. Because how this game has gone so far, there's a reason the kills are nine to one. Oh, cool. I didn't think about that synergy for Stukov, but he took, if he takes damage that puts him below 50% health, he puts a weighted push on all nearby enemies, and then he gets his bio kill switch back, and then now has the blind on bio kill switch. We'll see how it works out in this fight though. Isolation has hit here, but Team Freedom, very understanding of the fact that they must make this fight happen. They are running out of options. They're running out of time. But all the disengage with flailing swipe. Stukov and the rest of Roll20 get out. That was really well done from Roll20 to understand the situation and understanding that that wasn't necessarily the best opportunity for them in this game. Not a fight they need. Burned a couple of soft resources. It was maybe a bit more than they would have liked to see across the board. But they baited out the Archon and the Avatar. Suddenly, everyone is within lethal now because you can force the ancestral with the next flip it's just if you get one defensive cooldown out of team freedom that makes the next one twice as likely to go off which makes the next one almost 100 percent likely to go off and suddenly you find yourself down too many cooldowns to actually take these fights as long as justing is giving the old flip right into the squad of roll 20 which he has done far too many times in this game it's a domino effect it really is, except they're just bigger dominoes after, and the odds of them hitting harder are almost 100%. Jussing, not able to go up and oh, scare anybody more. away. Flip. Taunt. Cure does have metamorphosis. Goes down, wasn't on to Cure, so. But look at that silence, the pressure put onto Zugrug. Leyline's gotta come out, right? There's the pull in. Dansky! He gets it. Blown Lit up. On to Cure. Leyline is going down. Portal's going to be used for Glorong. Drag landing on to Rhaegar. Collusion's going to be one dead pupper. And now two members of Freedom are dead. The Bud or Buds is going to drop himself a slow. I mean, I don't honestly have words at this point. It's just been Watch Roll 20 dominate this game. That was such a frustrating moment for Team Freedom. They needed one more gem. They just needed one more gem, and Roll20 got in, pushed them back, took two kills. 
Now they're on top of the boss. They're keeping track of both of the turn-in points, too. The gyms are available if they can stop Goku from stopping Zug right for this turn-in. Cloud gets it. They need a hard CC, otherwise the Glaring is not threatened. Oh, the drag not landing. Second time that's happened for the members of Rule 20 there, misjudging the max distance to get an interrupt. The boss now is going to be revealed. Everybody on Team Freedom knows what's going on. They're not going to do anything about it here. This is a pretty big advantage for Rule 20. It essentially negates every web weaver through mid and bottom, and more importantly, they can then make something happen with the 20 advantage afterwards. Yeah, there's no time for Team Freedom to get 20 along with this web weaver phase. It's just flat out. Goodbye, gems. It was nice knowing you. You went into the little two little coin slot sections of Tomb of the Spider Queen. You came out as a couple of spiders, but at the end of the day, you didn't get too much done here. Have you ever noticed she walks with her arms up? It's kind of weird, don't you think? Like, I don't know spiders too well, and like, they'll total, like, but I just think it's weird she kind of walks around with, like, her arms up this, like she's a robot. Are those mandibles? I mean, the I, smaller arms? I think I'd apply that word to them, yes, but I don't know if that's the exact definition. We're going to have to bring in one of the Blizzard employees for that one. All right. Boss has been dealt with, and Team Freedom are c closing in on 19, but 20 is here for Roll20, and they have enough gems for their Web Weaver phase. Starting the push on the uh, minion waves. Dahaka is pushing it down that bottom lane. Um, they're just moving the waves as far as they can so they can get immediate presence toward the base of Team Freedom while they still have 20 well ahead of Freedom. This might be the death push. It very much could be game here. Team Freedom. How do they stop it? I, 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 I've come up with my only solution to it. I, granted, you know, I've only gotten to see less Garrosh than even these guys, but it just seems like not letting them go around, get multiple combos. And you don't you don't want to do that into a 20, but I don't think you have an option anymore. This is going to be it if you don't have an answer here, Team Freedom. So you just started in the bottom lane. Glau's got a portal. So you can go back and forth between the lanes, helping out the web weavers. Man, look how far back Freedom has to sit. Look how confident Justin is, too. He's just like, dude, any of you, get in my face. I'm ready for this. All right, the call's been made to give up the bot, go deal with the other web weavers. Don't lose the game. Portal play through men. Cure. Not like this, Cure. Oh, gosh. This is closer. Leyline, Medivh cheats. He met oh. it. Oh. He's a god. <laughs> oh, my. That was so well done. Oh, they're not out of the woods yet, though. Zugra gets pulled back in, taunted out of his dwarf toss. Now, both in the silence, collusion so dangerously low in health. But in the end, nobody goes down. A lot of heroics traded for both sides. Three on the side of roll 20, but only two from that of Team Freedom. 20 is closing in here for TF. Can they make it happen? Illidan doing his best to get the soak throughout the mid lane. He's taking out those ranged minions. 20 will be here before this keep dies on top. The question is, does Team Freedom actually win this fight if they end up forcing it? Illidan rotates. Rotating around. No hunt to dive on top of somebody like Prismaticism. 20 goes online. Zugrug hits the Storm Bolt. Zugrug's on top of the team now, and the rest will follow. They're ready to get into the fight. This is the fight to determine the game. One swipe coming out from Roll20, but two still remain. Another portal, and that's the all she wrote when it came to the team fight. Team Freedom has got to find another avenue. Without having the gem still sitting at that 22 mark away, the only thing they can do is a boss, and that is still one minute and 24 seconds away for a win condition for Team Freedom. It's Roll20's game to lose left and right, but if it's going to happen, I'm assuming it's there. And it's probably going to be between Medivh's Leyline Seal and most likely Metamorphosis once again. That interaction between those two is so crucial to making sure they get that point if it does come down to that boss control moment. But Freedom's got to do a lot to stall out the game to that point. Yeah, Roll20 didn't even have to use Flailing Swipe to get away with that. The portal was enough. And that part of that is because we see Archon over uh, Force Wall to slow down the retreat of Roll 20. And speaking of that, Archon Dansky's doing his best to keep the duration of that going. Oh, get it. He needs one more. Justin gets a flip. Nasmus gets taunted in. 
Cure metas onto the back line. They're looking to get the all-in fight. They're trying to make sure the force, but with that fort available in the lane line, splitting the members, they are unable to aggress any farther. Dainsky, 1v3 onto the back line, though, while the rest of the members of Roll20 trying to kill elsewhere. They end up losing a member. That is Dahaka down. Roll20 shows that they can bleed, and now Freedom wants themselves this turn in. That separation of Team Freedom was impeccable. They forced Dahaka to go south while the rest, Cure and Dansky on that Tassadar did enough that they were able to push everyone else up toward the top. Man, that was a flip that did a ton of damage to Murden just because it was on top of that fort. One thing I do want to know is there's been a lot less lurking arm follow-up to the flip coming out from Garage than I assumed. We almost always have the slowing sands going down, but because of the cast time duration onto the lurking arm, it has not been nearly as fluid as I assumed the synergy here from the members of Rule 20 would be. But also beyond a drag, they don't have any hard CC to keep you locked down after that flip, which may be a bit of the reason. To be honest, never been able to play the Stukov into the Garrosh synergy, so I don't know how hard it is to predict. But I assume it's like a, it's like the hardcore version of Diablo Toronto, you know, or Stitches Malfurion. Yeah, well, because you can choose the location of where they drop, you know, it's not like a Diablo where you know exactly where it's going to drop. Yeah. If it's not exactly communicated, and because there's that little bit of ramp up time, I can see how it would be a very difficult combination to hit. 23 minutes into this game, and Team Freedom finds another chance for some Web Weavers. About the only chance, it feels like. There is a boss immediately after this Web Weaver phase. It will be a lot. And when that happens, as I said before, I think that's going to be the thing. It's either Roll20 sneaks a turn in, which I don't believe they have available to them for at least about 10 more gems. Oh, but that flip combo. Taunt. Everybody's alive. Zugrug's going to be okay. Portal's load th thrown down. Nobody goes through. And it looks like it's just poke. So top and bottom web weaver still alive, but it's all about the boss afterwards. We have to keep our eyes on it. More importantly, the fact that bottom web weaver had catapults to deal with the entire time, Team Freedom is going to go in. They didn't get very much of anything down there. Meta jumps on top of a lot of the members, but with Leyline Seal, here was on an island alone from the rest. Drag catches Murden and is right into he the silence, but he did live. Dwarf tossing out around the slowing sands. He ends up surviving here. Nice swipe, split, splitting Nazmus. Chromie throwing down the spells, getting the damage done. Cure is looking to go in. Dwarf Toss is going to follow up right afterwards as they are in hot pursuit of Buds. Justin falling low, but unable to go down yet. Drag's gonna land, and that is now a first kill. Zugrug, first member to go down, roll 20. They have a portal in a few seconds, and you see the missiles hailing down. There's the portal, pull, and the silence not going to get the follow-up, but a beautiful force of will keeps Justin alive, reabsorption, gets the heal on out, and Dainsky falls now. This is roll 20, turning it up. Here, fighting until he cannot, and the taunt on top of the silence spells the doom of Rhaegar, the final member of Team Freedom Standing. Freedom lasted a long time in this game, winning the fights that mattered to allow them to get back to 20, get a turn in, start pressuring Roll20. But in the end, Roll20 were able to win the team fight, baiting a lot of the members of Team Freedom with the low health bar of Justing. But with all that armor, the reabsorption, force of will, all the heals of Stukov, the kill wasn't there for Team Freedom. They lost it all. They lost their core. They will lose game three in the series. But Rule 20 takes a victory, three to zero. Really flexing there with that Garrosh. Justin busting it out here and just 3-0 on it already here for phase number two. I'm impressed. I'm ready to see how far it goes because we know typically Rule 20 is comfortable with building high amount of synergy with specific heroes. A couple of alternative variations of that composition. It's just how far past that does that go? Uh, I feel like it's very funny because both of those teams kind of have that exact same trend. It's just Roll20 came out on top, it feels like, quite heavily, actually, uh, in this one. But what's really cool for Roll20, at least, is that it's a warrior. And we know how far down the warrior list Justin has of being able to uh, work well in the combos for the team, no matter what they are going to pick warrior-wise with Ooh, that was a rough one. Uh, with the Medivh of Glaurung, they're still able to make it work in a lot of different ways, like the Diablo on the tomb. Now we're going to see Garrosh, too. Uh, we've seen, I think, them play even ETC along with the Medivh, so it's cool that it is Justing's hero that we're seeing be the flex. Yeah, they're getting that variation onto him, because it is true, because he busted out with like some of the wildest 
warrior decision making it feels like when it comes to the priority and in the end made everybody else kind of follow and justified uh his picks across the board and i'm expecting garrosh to kind of be that hero at least for now uh you know i i i'm still not totally sold but i am very impressed with the performance that they had onto it i'm just trying to figure out is this way too often like was that a misplay on the side of you know the opponent's not respecting the positioning or isn't garrosh actually reliably able to get that many throws and if the answer is yes I mean, there's about nobody who can deal with that because there's so little burst supporting left in the game. There's so few cleanse opportunities. It, I mean, it pretty much goes, you have to initiate or you have to be able to out-sustain. How many Murdens we see live through that? Not very many. Well, let me be clear. They lived through it. They didn't live through it in a fact that would actually allow them to stand mm -hmm. any chance in the team fight, right? There's a difference from like, I didn't die. And there's like a, I'm ready to keep going. Like I'm at the 50%. I can throw down a solid 13 heal. Like I can c get back to life, throw down a secondary storm bolt, and maybe dwarf toss away. It's just flat. They're going in and they're running right away. Well, there is, there's a couple of different things. I think it comes down to being able to avoid the queue, but if you can land the pole reliably and you know how to put it in a situation where you can immediately follow up with your E, then yeah, you've got that combo up a lot. Let's talk to the master himself, Justing. Hey, Justing, congratulations. Did you guys think it would be a 3-0 victory over Freedom today? Uh, hey, thanks. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if we really had a score in mind, but we thought we were going to win and 3-0 is the best we can do, so I'm happy about it. Nice. Well, we've got to talk to you about your Garrosh. We've seen it here and there, both in Europe and North America, but you busting him out every single game. Do you feel really feel like he is every single game worthy until someone stops you? Uh, right now, I feel like people mostly just don't really know how to play against him. And I think he is a little overtuned, honestly. And I, I haven't looked at the patch notes because it wasn't relevant to this match, but I heard he's getting even stronger, so that's scary. Um, I think he's pretty good, though. And I think on specific maps, he's almost first pick, if not first pick, which is what we were doing. We were just getting it every game, so works for me. Also worked pretty well with your patented Medivh strategy in game three. Uh, we saw you have a little bit different of a build, too, building into more of the throw. Is that... Uh, do you see a lot of build variation for him, or do you really feel like that's the best build to go? I think that the level one talent, I think there are, there pretty much are all three different options, depending on what you're going for. I think the Q talent is definitely really good, but I mostly prefer that when they have like a Chen, or I plan on going the attack speed talent at seven, yeah. like uh, or like an ETC or something that I need to interrupt, that I need more Qs. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, I feel like for me, I get more value out of just throwing heroes farther, mostly. Awesome. Well, it was really fun to watch. Fred? My thoughts or um, question is targeted a bit more towards a different hero that you guys were willing to flex out. The Stukov of the last game, is that only going to be like mm -hmm. a synergy with Garrosh type thing? Or do you think that maybe there's some hope that I get me some more Stukov? Hopefully Stukov? Uh, I think there's, yeah, I think there's hope for more Stukov. Buds likes the hero a lot. He's He really enjoys him. So I think we will definitely see more Stukov. That's awesome to hear. You guys had a really amazing performance. I'm actually going to attach onto that. Uh, just... What are you guys' thoughts, or I guess more of the feeling, since you were able to take that break by not end up qualifying? And I know teams like Team Dignitas Food is more of like a positive thing, even though it's like mm. upsetting, obviously, but it was able to gain more out of it. Um, I'm just curious, mm. do you feel that was the same case with you guys in World 20, or is that more of just like a, uh, you know, it, was just, it just sucked, and that's all there was to it? Uh, I think it was mostly a good thing. I wasn't too frustrated about it, because we still needed to do some rebuilding as a team, and that gave us a lot of time to, like, just like relax and be in like a good stress like stress-free environment where we can work on our issues and now i think we've gotten to the point where we've got most of our team issues fixed so i think we're all looking forward to doing a lot better in this split to the previous one and blizzcon's the one that matters to us so i think it's a good thing awesome here thank you very much justin justin okay. last question before i let you give some shout outs and that's about your match versus tempo storm tomorrow uh what are your thoughts on that matchup uh, I think Team Freedom should be the stronger team. So with that said, I think we should 3-0. All right. Well, good luck with that tomorrow. We'll <laughs> let you give shout-outs. All right. Thanks, Gilly. Uh, shout-outs to my team and for all the fans who follow and support us. And shout-outs to our sponsor, Roll20. Uh, I just retweeted something on my Twitter. Uh, shameless plug. You can check it out. We're selling these jerseys soon. Or, well, now we're selling them. You can check it out. They're pretty cool jerseys. Uh, yeah. They're pretty dope. <laughs> pink. Yeah. All right. Good job yeah. and good luck tomorrow, Justin. See you later. All right. Thanks a lot. See you guys. I didn't expect a 3 0.
for this series, but I am really happy for Roll20 that they were able to come back in, not let the loss of going to the Western Clash affect them and put their best uh, performance on. I agree with you. The only way I would have said this series was a 3-0 is if Freedom was the victor. I, there was no chance I thought Roll20 would come in in 3-0. But I'm... We have been too inconsistent at the beginning to the end of every phase to where I'm just like, I refuse to believe this is the case. Like, there, it has been three, two times in a row. You can't count the first, but even the first got a little bit wild considering the background if you knew HDC before the HDC model. I mean, it was, it's only gotten crazier and crazier. And so I'm just going with like, a, I could see next week Team Freedom is the best team in NA and it's not even close. And the week after that, that maybe Roll20 is the team suddenly struggling. Like, we have way too much variance here. So at the end of the day, it's a really, it was awesome to be able to finally get NA going back again. But I'm not like, I refuse to believe this, this is an assessment of the power rankings. It's just, that's done. <laughs> we had a we day. We got week one. We got a day. We had a day. We had day number one of week one. And we can look at these standings as a result of that day that we did indeed have. <laughs> <laughs> it starts the with the tie. <laughs> It gets closer. You're right. With that 5-3, actually, for East Bo or Roll20, it now makes Tempo Storm just only one loss away from being a day even. And then, more importantly, Team Freedom there. Still closing it in in that gap. Space Station Gaming, though, after their victory of the day, they did a good job of at least separating. Didn't they lose? You're right. They ended up losing. That was, I don't know why I said that. <laughs> You are right. They ended up losing. I was like sitting there. You're not. You're like. No, I don't think that's <laughs> happened. I was like, at least they were able to separate the gap. But you're right. They just flat lost from Lag Force for some reason. That's how Auto. Like I assume that series <laughs> yeah. was just done. It was just super, super, watch Space Station go in. No, we we both did. But th that's just another glory of <laughs> the changes, the inconsistencies. Is maybe Lag Force is back. I'm excited. Let's see what we have in store for tomorrow's HGC. Ooh, dread. It's pretty juice. That is juicy. You want to take, okay, Team Dignitas versus Fnatic. Then we've got Tricked Esport versus Zealots. But in North America, we have Roll20 versus Tempo Storm. Just a little bit of a note on that. Roll20 generally is the team that loses to Tempo on line. But they think that they've got what it takes to be able to get that victory over Tempo. And finally, Gale Force Esports versus Even in Death. I am such a fan of like looking at the past to figure out the future so like that my brain immediately looks at tempo storm and roll 20 and even though i genuinely think that roll 20 is a strong team i'm just like oh i guess we are yet to see tempo but according to the play that we've seen of tempo of last uh that it feels like that is the case but i'm just like tempos just doesn't lose online in that series you know last time we asked them how are you going to do against tempo storm they're like ah we got this it's good more is online it's going to matter and then they end up not making it to the western clash in the process you know so it's just I don't know. Hey, it's one of those like I refuse to believe as well. Like I just I'm ready to prove it through the gameplay, not through the words. That's where I'm at here. Well, I really want to see uh, who in North America are the top teams that we've had cheering for at home. Gale Force, Roll20, and Tempo. Look how close they are. Those are actually surprisingly close there. Not too much difference between either one of them. And, you know, not surprising the fact that those are some of the most dominant teams in the North American scene sitting right at the top of the cheer list. Get hype, friends, who have been cheering for these teams because all three of them play tomorrow. That is actually surprisingly convenient as well. It's a good day to cheer tomorrow, I guess. Break the 16 million mark. Let's keep it going. Heck, yeah. It's been a good day to cheer all around. And we have actually the top 10 users who have been cheering so far for all of HGC. Gladman still sitting at the top, like in Europe, and respectfully so. I mean, he's just, let's be honest, dominating the charts there a bit. Already doubled down over top of second place. My goodness. No guy on a personal level, pretty cool guy. So thank you very much for the cheer there, Gladman. But everybody else on the list, you guys as well, thank you very much for your contributions here towards HGC and cheering for your guys' favorite teams. Keep doing it. Keep unlocking those items, cheering for the teams, supporting the teams. Unlike Gilly, who doesn't support for the teams and doesn't cheer for the teams. I cheer for you, Dred. Thank you. You're welcome. I really wish you could cheer for me. Not so much on a financial level, but more I just need, you know, little dread emotes going through the chat. Otherwise, I don't have any self-confidence. <laughs> you don't have anything. He just doesn't have anything I to cast for. Secretly over here, I just keep up Twitch chat, and I just constantly <laughs> look for compliments, and that's the only way I'm going to survive. 
just a little secret into the life of a caster, and that caster being Dreadnought. That's it for us for today. Thank you so much for hanging out with us here at the Heroes Global Championship. We'll see you tomorrow. Wow.